So Mark Bogusky, uh, he received his private pilot certificate in 1977. After a long career in the aerospace industry, he made a career change in 2016 and took a vow of poverty and became a flight and ground instructor. Mark has a passion for teaching. He's now a full-time independent flight instructor here in Olathe, Kansas, and an aviation instructor at Johnson County Community College. Mark also conducts Rusty Pilot seminars for AOPA, as well as writing for various aviation publications. Mark is a partner in a 1977 Piper Archer, a member of AOPA, EAA, and a FAST team representative for the Kansas City FISDO. He's also an active volunteer pilot with Young Eagles. So with that, Mark, it's all yours. All right, thank you, Chelsea. So uh, I add my welcome to everybody. And uh, uh, thank you for spending some of your Saturday here with us. I'll go ahead and uh, turn my camera off too so we could focus on the presentation. So um, I'm gonna provide a pilot's perspective. I'm Again, I'm a flight instructor. I'm not a, uh, a National Weather Service expert like the uh, Sarah and Chelsea. And so I'm going to provide a pilot's perspective so, to some of the turbulence things that the, that they uh, showed us. And let's see here. There we go. So again, um, I'm a full-time flight instructor now, uh, teaching out of Olathe, Kansas. And uh, you can see a couple of my grandchildren here that uh, uh, are flying with me. And uh, we like to go out all the time and all that, but occasionally, you know, we run into some turbulence and it can get rather exciting, right? Now, of course, the, the kids really enjoy that, but uh, sometimes the, uh, some pilots and their passengers don't enjoy that. So we're gonna talk about why the bumps. So we'll talk about uh, types of turbulence, uh, kind of reemphasize some of the things that Sarah talked about. And we'll talk about resources for general aviation pilots. Um, we'll talk, look at TAFT, uh, the GFA tool, and PIREPS. And then we'll also talk about how we deal with it as GA pilots. So I like to think of uh, you know, the air masses that we fly to uh, kind of correlate them to like a river, a nice, slow, lazy river when the uh, weather is, uh, or when the weather's good. And it can be a really pleasant time out there flying around and uh, you know, very smooth and uh, like, you know, we call it uh, airs like glass, right? But you take that same body of air or in this picture of water and you constrict it, you send it through an area that, you know, another air mass that's constricting that air or it's going over a rough surface or there's convective heating and it can turn into a rather turbulent mix. And it can make for that flight very, very exciting, right? Sometimes more than we really wish that we had to deal with. So here's an example of some extreme turbulence.
Okay, so there can be the aftermath of some of these uh, turbulent events. Now, uh, like Sarah was mentioning, um, and uh, Chelsea was mentioning, the uh, accident rate for turbulence-related events fairly consistently runs in the 20 to 40 percent range overall, year after year. Uh, these would be considered some of the wind-related uh, statistics that she was showing. And uh, so it's a fairly high percentage of uh, GA type accidents. And fortunately though, they're typically not uh, fatal, but there can be some real adverse ones up, of course. For general aviation, generally turbulence is more inconvenience versus a safety issue. It really affects your passenger comfort and you know pe people's desire to fly. Um, it can really affect your schedule reliability. You know, if you've been flying down on a wonderful trip down to Florida, but then you run into a bunch of uh, convective turbulence, your passengers may not be willing to go back up and after a fuel stop, and they say, "Let's wait till it's a little bit less turbulent." Right. Um, at worst, you know, we can see some potential structural damage, and we'll talk about ways to uh, avoid that. And so. Uh, what I wanted to do is do a kind of a quick overview of the types of turbulence and their effect on general aviation. So we consider we've got basically six kinds of turbulence. Uh, convective is probably the most common one that we have to deal with. Uh, mechanical turbulence also is uh, a, a real issue, especially when we're coming in for landing. Uh, frontal turbulence, of course, is something that we deal with all the time. Um, if you're in, in the mountainous areas, mountain wave turbulence can be really severe. And then not so much a GA uh, perspective, but uh, we do have clear air turbulence that uh, affects aircraft. And then, of course, we especially in GA have to be careful of wake turbulence. So uh, similar to the slides that Sarah showed, uh, convective turbulence is something that we see all the time, particularly in the summer, when you have the heating of the uh, cooler air at the ground, it rises up and makes for a fairly bumpy ride below the clouds. Um, once we can get above the clouds, then we're in smooth air and uh, makes for a much nicer ride. And of course, there we have the uh, issue is you really need to be instrument rated to go up and uh, so you don't get caught up above the clouds and uh, things kind of close in below you, right? On landing, um, you know, we get the convective currents that happen to us and they can really affect our glide path. So as we go over different types of terrain and maybe bodies of water and all that, it can really affect us having a nice you know, stable glide path, which is what's really critical for making a, a good landing, right? And I found this slide and I thought it was a great illustration. This is some of the difficulty we see with turbulence. Uh, anytime you've got a warm air layer below and a cool air layer above, you know, gravity is wanting to move that cool air down. The warm air is less dense and it wants to rise and you get this mixing that happens. And so uh, for the middle uh, panel there, you know, you're gonna get a mixing and you'll have some bumps as you go. But if you've got a larger difference between the uh, cool air and warm air and all that, it can become a very turbulent flow and you can have some uh, very dramatic bumps in that, that uh, fluid characteristics between that, with that mixing between cool air and hot air can get very dramatic. And I think this uh, bottom panel shows a very uh, interesting simulation of what that looks like. And it's very difficult for scientists to categorize what that's gonna be, and hence a lot of times the trouble we have with uh, forecasting turbulence. The other part of convective turbulence, of course, is it's associated with thunderstorms. And this is, a huge uh, hazard for general aviation. Just uh, 
a quick uh, overview again. You know, stage one is where we have the cumulus stage where the cumulus clouds start developing and there's turbulence associated with that. Once we get into the mature stage, and then we've got updrafts and downdrafts, and that's causing um, a great amount of turbulence within that uh, and near that uh, thunderstorm. And then finally, the dissipating stage, and that's where we've got all downdrafts, but it can also create a great amount of uh, turbulence as we're flying in and near those uh, uh, thunderstorms. Uh, Rob Machado has a good uh, slide uh, that he prevented, presents in his books. And uh, again, from a GA perspective, we want to make sure that we stay at least 20 nautical miles away from thunderstorms. Um, and we uh, want to make sure that we don't get caught between cells like this. I had an example of this happen to me one time. I was flying out in eastern Colorado. And uh, there was this one large single-celled uh, storm and uh, developing out over the prairies. And I you know, uh, was on an IFR flight plan. ATC cleared me to deviate around that. And once I got to the back side of it, I thought that I would be able to you know, just go straight to my destination. And I called ATC and uh, reported to them, you know, um, clear the thunderstorm and like to you know, resume a direct destination. And they cleared me for that. And I think no sooner than they did that, when all of a sudden I got slammed, it felt like a fist hitting my aircraft. And I was descending, uh, my VSI was pegged out. Uh, I was just trying to hold the wings level. Um, I did what my training taught me to do. I pulled back uh, my throttle, uh, got below uh, maneuvering speed and just try to maintain wings level and fly past this area. In just a matter of few seconds, I lost 1,500 feet. So I went from uh, uh, 10,000 feet down to 8,500, or uh, 25, I, sorry, I lost 2,500, I was down to 7,500 feet. And I was just shaking, right? And I didn't know what, what parts of the airplane were still there. And I thought I was out of it, and all of a sudden, bam, I got hit with another uh, downdraft and again my vsi pegged out and i'm just holding on for dear life and i lost another 1500 feet um and the at this out in eastern colorado the ground's not that far away from uh, there so i got down to about 6000 feet and uh um finally got out of it um i called ATC and, you know, to let him know that I'd hit, I'm hit by this downdraft and everything like that. And the first thing he does is, oh, I see that your altitude's, uh, um, you know, way below what you were cleared for. And let me give you a block of altitude. And, and I was saying, gosh, you know, don't you think you'd be wondering, like, you know, are you still alive or how are you, you know, how's your aircraft doing and all that. But anyway, uh, managed to get out of that, uh, climb back up to 10,000 and, uh, um, made it to my destination, landed safely, thank God. But uh, just an illustration, I estimate that I was probably like 10 miles away from that thunderstorm. And I was in clear blue sky, sun was shining, but the downdrafts coming from that thunderstorm were incredibly dramatic. Something I never want to experience again, and I always tell my students about it so that they can not make that same mistake that I did. Another thing associated, and Sarah mentioned this, but microbursts are typically associated with um, convective activity. And they're very, very hard to predict. Um, and you need to, if, if you were to get in one or, or get near one and all that, you need to get out of there as, as fast as you can or as best you can. Uh, microbursts cause dramatic um, uh, downdrafts and they can also, even if they're not, even if you're not caught in a, a downdraft like that, uh, the shearing from headwind to tailwind can also be uh, very devastating to a, a small general aviation aircraft. There's a uh, advisory circular that the FAA puts out, uh, 00-24 Charlie, and uh, it would be advisable for pilots to review that, and it has good information and associated information 
about hazardous flying around thunderstorms and low-level wind shear. Uh, mechanical turbulence is something that we see all the time. Uh, some of our bigger airports have bigger hangars around them, and uh, um, you know, some of our smaller airports, there might be trees or things like that, and so we have to deal with that mechanical turbulence as well. Mechanical turbulence is also caused by, um, you know, um, terrain, you know, hills, mountains, things like that, that as the wind blows over them, they can cause that mechanical turbulence and make for a real bumpy ride. Uh, convective and mechanical turbulence often happen together. And I, I found this slide was very interesting. Florida State had a, a, uh, some data they were collecting up in Caribou, Maine. And this was wind speed observations on a spring day. And you can see that the combination of convective and mechanical during the you know, afternoon hours was fairly uh, significant compared to the early morning or late afternoon hours there where uh, you didn't have the wind speed, so the mechanical turbulence was less, and you didn't have the, the heating and the convective turbulence was less. So that's uh, an interesting way of looking at what we're dealing with uh, on the uh, um, mid-afternoon mid flights, right? Frontal turbulence is something that we all experience. And as uh, I think uh, Sarah mentioned, when you've got that mixing of two different air masses and all that, you know, the pictures that we see in our books are, are you know, this, this homogeneous front coming through, but the reality is there's a lot of turbulence associated with these fronts. When you have a, a warm front or a cold front um, approaching, um, then you can expect or you're gonna get some of that turbulence and it may be, um, convective, like the uh, the bottom um, panel, or it may be a little bit more uh, stratus type clouds um, and more smooth air. But when that frontal boundary hits, you're you can expect that turbulence to happen. Now in Kansas, we don't have to worry about mountain waves, but uh, if you're out visiting the you know the uh, Western Rockies and all. Uh, there you have to be concerned about experiencing mountain wave turbulence. And this is an excellent shot uh, depicting lenticular clouds that are associated with mountain waves. And how that's caused by is as you have mountains passing over and it drives the air currents up, uh, lenticular clouds can form as that moisture uh, is driven up and into cooler air and those cloud caps can form over mountains. But they can also, downwind, be, the same thing happen. And because the air, as it goes down the side, it, it compresses and then goes back up and you can get these lenticular clouds. And they're just illustrative of below them, there's some severe turbulence. These rotors that you see are uh, areas of very severe turbulence. I thought this was a good illustration of uh, what you can see and why those lenticular clouds can form. And kind of like my uh, initial uh, slides and all that, remember that air has fluid properties, it compresses and can uh, literally cause this wave breaking action that uh, even up higher up above the mountains and all that at higher altitudes, you can get some severe turbulence associated with these mountain waves. This was a very interesting shot. Um, you can get some severe turbulence. This was a, um, a B-52 that was being used for research and it lost uh, most of its uh, vertical stabilizer um, flying through and uh, examining mountain waves. Fortunately, it was able to land safely, but you know, great amount of aircraft damage occurred there. Now, we don't have to deal with clear air turbulence very much. This is more associated with that video that we saw. And uh, in this case here, uh, it's caused by different jets that are mixing with each other, uh, typically a faster jet and a slower jet 
uh, mixing and causing that clearer turbulence. So a cloudless sky and uh, you know flying way above any convective turbulence and you can get into that clear air turbulence. And finally, wake turbulence. And that's something, of course, that we all need to be concerned about when we're operating around larger aircraft. And uh, as you are, remember, the FAA uh, talks about if you're landing, you want to land beyond where the uh, larger aircraft has landed uh, to avoid their wake. And if you're taking off, you want to take off before those larger aircraft take off and divert yourself away from the potential wake that uh, they cause. And uh, finally, I guess there is one other kind of turbulence and all that, and uh, see this all the time, but uh, pilot-induced turbulence can be a real factor. And uh, it can uh, also be a little fun for you at times, right, when you're flying with passengers that are maybe a little bit nervous. So. So uh, what kind of tools do we have uh, for us as pilots? Uh, so METARs and TAFs are one of the major things, obviously, we check. And in this example here, we saw that uh, in the TAF, wind shear at 2,000 feet was predicted. Um, and so 50 knots uh, from 240. Um, I actually went flying on this day and went through that area of forecast wind shear and uh, you know we saw a change in the wind and all uh, but we didn't really have any turbulence associated with it and that's the thing about wind shear um, like this sometimes you're going to experience a lot of turbulence associated with it and sometimes you know you'll go through it and you'll say well like oh I really didn't feel very much there Um, the, GA, the GFA tool, um, if you use the aviationweather.gov website and then uh, the uh, GFA tool that's associated with it, is a wonderful tool for looking at it. And if you go to the forecast uh, area and click on the turbulence, you can see that the uh, turbulence is displayed in different severity of colors and give you an idea of uh, what kind of turbulence you might have and where you might want to avoid that flying in through that area. We'll also mention to you and put a plug in for um, the aviationweather.gov and it's uh, they're working on a new version of the uh, uh, GFA tool. And if you go to beta.aviationweather.gov and you can try out their, uh, their new look that they're presenting. This will be a more mobile friendly uh, GFA tool, but uh, it has the same information, but they're really looking forward to pilots trying it out and giving them comments and all that. So I uh, highly recommend you take a look at that and give it a try and uh, give the, um, the programmers uh, in the National Weather Service a chance to uh, see your pilot comments on what this new tool looks like for you. Here's an example of turbulence, and uh, in this example here, I just selected uh, the uh, below 18,000 feet, kind of a, a broad overview looking at some of the turbulence. And then I uh, looked at a specific area. Uh, I was thinking about going down to New Mexico and um, looked at some turbulence at some different altitudes. And that's one of the great things about this tool is you can look at different altitudes. And so in this case here, you see at 6,000 feet, uh, you know, fair amount of turbulence forecast uh, in the uh, Eastern New Mexico and West Texas area. And then I tried up, I, I, you can zoom in and uh, you can click on those air mets and get the uh, indication here of what that uh, forecast is for. And then in this case here, I said, well, let's try 9,000, see if that might be better. And you can see in this case here that uh, at least in the Texas area, it, the turbulence was going to be less, and the air met for um, the eastern side of New, uh, New Mexico 
uh, was not there, but we still had it down in southern New Mexico. I think it's pyreps, and uh, uh, Chelsea showed us some pyreps and all that. This is one that I provided. Uh, I was up with a student in a Cessna 150, and it was a beautiful sunny day. And just as we went through uh, 4,000 feet, uh, we hit uh, a layer of just real severe or moderate turbulence, I'd call it. And uh, it was just once we went through that cherry and went up higher above it, um, then we were, we were fine. But uh, that layer there, and so I provided a PIREP for hopefully for other uh, pilots in the area that they might know to ex what to experience there. Here's another PIREP that I provided. I was flying back from Minnesota and uh, just the whole way I was under uh, overcast layer um, and couldn't get up on top. And just the entire trip was just bumping along with uh, uh, just continuous light turbulence. It was not a fun time, but uh, sometimes that's what we have to deal with in GA, right? Another example of uh, pyreps that you can see here, widespread all over uh, central United States, and everything from uh, icing to turbulence and everything else listed. But pyreps are huge. I really encourage you to uh, provide them whenever you're flying and try to give uh, both other pilots and the forecasters a uh, chance to see what is really going on up there once you're flying. One of the things I really love, I use uh, ForeFlight extensively and they have uh, on their scratch pad uh, tab, they've got a uh, panel for doing pyreps and all that. So this is my horrible writing, trying to write uh, in the uh, aircraft, but uh, just copy it down and uh, then when I get a chance, I give flight service a call and uh, provide them a PIREP. So from a GA perspective, uh, how do we deal with uh, turbulence? And oh, here we go, we've got a poll comment on how you deal as a pilot, how you deal with turbulence and all that. So we'll give uh, everyone a few minutes to uh, answer the poll. I don't know if Scott can tell us the results there. Yeah, hi Mark, looks like we got 65% uh, fly early or fly late, 5% uh, prepare your passengers and 30% try changing altitude. Yep. And all of those things are good strategies for dealing with it. Um, sometimes you can't, don't have the luxury of uh, flying early before turbulence starts or flying that late. Um, in, in my case, uh, there's a po poll results. In my case, my wife is a very nervous flyer. And so when I actually do get her to fly with me, um, and I really need to prepare her for what it's going to be like and talk her through, you know, what kind of turbulence we might have and all that. So in the case of, you know, I'm, we're going to be uh, experiencing turbulence as we're taking off most likely, but once we get to altitude, things will smooth out. And, uh, and then, you know, once we're up there, if we do start hitting some bumps and stuff like that, um, you know, look for the flexibility of changing altitudes. The other thing that if you do get into uh, you know, more moderate turbulence and everything like that, remember that you can slow down, you wanna slow down below maneuvering speed uh, so that you don't overstress your aircraft. We wanna make sure that, uh, um, you know, if we are getting into an area of moderate to severe turbulence and all that, that we slow the aircraft down and get below maneuvering speed. So just kind of to wrap things up for here, um, remember with GA, you know, we've got greatly underpowered aircraft. Um, if we aren't able to uh, either change altitudes quickly, or if we're in an area of uh, you know strong winds and all that, uh, we're we're having to deal with those um, and. Uh, um, we're not able to outclimb them or like that. Um, 
another thing is we self-brief the weather typically. And I, I personally still love to call 1-800-WX-BRIEF to get a briefing and talk with a briefer. Uh, but more and more people are self-briefing with uh, EFBs and with uh, internet resources. And the other thing that we always have to remember is generally we're single pilot. And so particularly if you are flying IFR, uh, your, your workloads can be quite high. And so you really need to prepare yourself for that flight and any you know turbulence or weather that you might expect. Um, as uh, we saw some of those early statistics, wind can be uh, one of the largest causes of accidents for GA. And so we really need to respect the wind, you know, and take measures that we need to to protect our ship and our crew. And with that, I want to thank you very much for spending your Saturday with us.